Like the disciples, we experience a mixture of joy, fear, and disbelief at the news of the risen Jesus. Receive us, O God, just as we are. Let us quiet ourselves in preparation for worship. like a drunk, but I'm not drunk. It was just plain coffee, okay? <laughs> Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to worship and fellowship on this spring... Spring? Who wrote this? <laughs> okay, on this morning... We're blessed that you're sharing the gift of yourself with us and with the Lord. Good morning. We have a lot of interesting things going on in our church. Do you know right behind you is a lot of items that are from the Asian, if I, I pronounce that wrong, group in uh, Africa that have made these beautiful things and they're extremely reasonable. Please take a look at them. All the proceeds go to Omar's orphans and we know about them. Then there is a sign up sheet in the back because we're having a rummage sale with the proceeds going to Omar's orphans it will be held in Fellowship Hall on May 6th from 8 till 4 in the afternoon. Please offer to help, and I know you have things at home that you'd really gladly give to the rummage sale and get them out of your house because any items you want to donate are appreciated and you just put them in what they refer to as the elevator room. I didn't know we had one, we have a lift. An elevator room in the basement. And please try to remember to bring things and volunteer to help that day. On, see, uh, what else is gonna ha happen is we're having this Wednesday room at the table at 5.30. It is hosted by the Congregational Church. The guest speaker is to be Kendra Weston 
from the Midwest Mental Health, something Joan and I are interested in, aren't we, Joan? Okay. Don't forget something that I think is so important, my personal belief. Don't forget to pray for the people under the health and healing list in our bulletin. Sometimes you could just repeat their names because these people need our prayers. We need lay leaders. Don't forget to sign up or else I'll have to do it again and you don't want that. Okay, ready? Is that a threat or a promise, Helen? <laughs> okay, now we're going to join us with our gathering hymn, Open the Eyes of My Heart, Lord. I always say that. Number 452, and glory to God. Friends, we have done this one before, so I am going to begin it and will allow you to jump in when you feel comfortable or inspired. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Join me in the responsive reading. We have been walking, Lord, on the roads of uncertainty and fear, on roads of exhaustion and doubt, on winding roads that have led us here. Join us on our journey, Lord. The presence refresh our spirits, set our hearts ablaze, and give us new direction. Now is the time to worship God. Let's turn to the hymn of praise, O Day of Rest and Gladness, 393 and Glory to God.
when we say we don't sin, we deny who we are. But when we say there's no way out, we deny who God is. Trusting that God's grace is more powerful than our sin, let us confess our sins together. Let us pray. Jesus, Jesus teacher, teacher, we confess, confess today our, our foolishness. foolishness. We, we have been, been foolish, foolish to doubt your promises, foolish to withhold love from our neighbor, neighbor. Foolish to chase riches, prestige, and power. Foolish to waste your gifts and spoil your creation. Foolish to divide your children against each other. Wise us up again. Open our hearts to your presence in our lives, in our neighbors, in our world, in your grace. Help, Help us, us to grab, grab onto, onto our, our million second, second chance and follow you yet, yet again. again. Amen. Amen. Please join me in the responsive assurance of God's grace. Hear the good news. New life is not only possible, it has drawn near to us in Jesus. The <clears throat> promise is for you and for all the children of God. By the grace of God, the glory of Christ, and the gift of the Holy Spirit, we are forgiven and we are free. Hallelujah. Amen. Ellen, thanks for helping out this morning. And would the young people join me for some time together? Up front. I'm so glad that you are here this morning and it is so good to see you. I want to show you something this morning, and I don't know if you've ever seen it before or seen anything like it, or maybe you even have one. Have you ever seen this? What do you, it says Jesus? Can you see Jesus? Do you see Jesus? You can't read it. Sometimes we see it. May, can you, maybe, Caroline, can you come down here and, and maybe help Caroline to show where the letters are? That's a J. See the J? E? And S U. And, and the S on the end. Sometimes we see blocks of wood, and sometimes we see Jesus. Do you see Jesus in there? Yeah. And you see it now? You know what? A friend gave this to me a long time ago, and what it reminds me is that Jesus is always with us, right? That's what Easter is all about. Jesus is alive and always with us. Sometimes we see him, and sometimes we don't. Sometimes we recognize him, Sometimes we don't. Sometimes he surprises us where we are. And sometimes we don't see it or notice it, right? Because we're not in control. He is. So, this morning, I have something to give you. I have three things to give you this morning. Now, does this help you see it better? It does, it does? And one for Caroline back there. And a little story. Once upon a time, there were some friends of Jesus who were walking down the road. And he came and walked with them. Except they couldn't recognize him. They didn't know who it was. They didn't recognize him. He walked with them all the way to their house. 
And they said, hey, Jesus, it's getting late. Why don't you come in, have dinner with us, spend the night so you don't have to travel any further? And Jesus said, well, okay, sure, and went in with them. And when they sat down to have dinner, he prayed over the food, and they recognized that it was him. And you know what he did after that? Poof! He disappeared. Right from the table. Poof. Don't know, but he did. But then the, the, the people who invited him in said, it was Jesus. Who knew? Oh, huh. You did, because you could see it. So that's a reminder. I've got two other things for you. A maze. A maze. And, and pictures of Jesus. Sometimes we recognize him. And sometimes we don't. But you are going to look at these together downstairs during church school. But I'm going to pray. And then you can go. I need two things. You need two things. Oh, right. You can stand up and stand here while we pray. Is that okay? All right. I am going to try to get two for Caroline. There. Right there. And two for my friend Owen. My goodness, these. Now, I think, I think. We're ready to pray. We're ready to pray. God, God thank, you thank you for, for helping, helping us, us to, to see, see Jesus. Jesus. Amen. 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 Got that from Evelyn Lindbergh, by the way. She and Lindy used to make those and give them to people out as gifts, along with those, you know, those peanut-shaped nativity pieces. Had one of those, too. I invite you to join your hearts and minds and spirits together with me in a moment of prayer. Holy Spirit, come among us. Come among, among us in ways that we can know and see, and hear, and taste. Come among us and bind us together. Open our hearts and our eyes in whatever condition we happen to be. Help us to see the living risen Jesus Christ who continues to feed us with your truth and your promises. We ask this in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Bible passage this morning, friends, is taken from the Gospel according to Luke, the 24th chapter, verses 13 through 35. The day on which this takes place is Easter, the very first Easter, probably sometime around, oh, midday or so, and this is the only place in the entire Bible where we learn of the disciple named Cleopas and a companion. Some scholars think that these two people that Jesus encounters on the road are husband and wife. A couple. We just don't know because it isn't explained. Whoever named Cleopas 
thought that the people they were writing to knew them well enough that we didn't know, need to know. The other part of this story is that they are on the road between Jerusalem and Emmaus. It was a hike of about the distance between here and Essex, about seven miles. And they were headed home after going to Jerusalem, not only for the Passover, but being in Jerusalem during the passion of Jesus and experiencing news of his resurrection. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things have taken place there in these days? He asked them, hmm, What things? And they replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us, they were at the tomb early this morning, and they did not know, they did not find his body there. And they came back and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it, just as the woman had said, but they did not see him. Then they said to him, then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it's almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them, then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour, they got up, returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, the Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he had been known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the word of the Lord. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Amen. Almost every culture 
in the world has some sort of story, some sort of fairy tale, some sort of folklore that is similar. And it goes something like this. Once upon a time, there was a king or a queen or a princess or a prince. The royalty decides that they need to leave the royal compound and go out and hobnob among the common folk. But they do it incognito. They disguise themselves as a stranger and then they leave the royal compound and set out on a journey to, to learn and experience firsthand how, how it is on the ground among the people of the realm. And usually how it is, the state of the union of the people in the realm depends on how good a job they're doing as royalty, as king, as queen, as prince or princess. And all of these stories eventually have a punchline, a, a moment of surprise, a surprise ending, the big reveal when the royalty takes off the disguise and shows themselves as they really are, as who they really are, to the great surprise of whoever it is that they've been with. Sometimes in the great big reveal, there's a reward. And sometimes there's punishment based on how whoever it was they were with treated a stranger. And almost always the story leaves everyone in the story changed by what has happened, what has taken place, what was learned, what was discovered, what was given. Maybe you've heard one of those stories. But I thought of those stories as I thought about our Bible passage this morning from the Gospel according to Luke on this third Sunday of Easter. On the Sundays after Easter, the Gospel stories are devoted to Jesus showing up, Jesus popping up in surprise visits to his friends and his disciples. Except they never know when he's going to show up. They never know where he's going to show up. They, they don't know how he's going to show up. But he always pops up. He finds them wherever they are. He joins them in whatever they're doing. He accepts them just the way they are. And in the process of revealing himself changes everything, changes their perspective, changes their condition, and equips them to be witnesses and practitioners of resurrection because they've seen him, they've been with him, he's been with them. So Luke gives us this story of Jesus appearing to an unsuspecting couple as they're making their way home from Jerusalem to Emmaus on that seven-mile hike. And like some of the stories that we've shared together in recent Sundays, there is so much going on in this particular story that it would take us a month of Sundays to parse it all. We could spend quite a bit of time just on this story on Sunday mornings and still not exhaust all of the meaning, all of the lines, and all of the interpersonal dynamics going on. So I want to, I want to encourage you to do this, those of us here in the sanctuary and those of us who are joining worship via Facebook or or. YouTube, on social media. I would like you to take some time and read this passage. Meditate on this passage. 
either later on today or over the course of the days ahead, I promise you will not be disappointed. You will see things you hadn't seen before. You will be aware of things going on that might be a little bit of surprising, be a little bit surprising. And if, you know what, if you find the sermon particularly boring this morning, you can read the passage right here and save yourself some time. I'm cool with that. Especially if you have that gift of reading with your eyes closed. But here's what I want to do in our time together. I want to share with you what the Spirit has led me to share. You see, those disciples were on a journey. We, too, are on a journey. On a journey of life, on the journey of faith. And on this journey, we are always on our way from one place to another, aren't we? We're always on one way of being to another. And on any given day, we are in a different condition based on what's going on, based on our lives, based on a million different things. And the thing is that while we're on this journey, things get so daily that we miss something, right? Life is so daily on this journey. You have yourself a Wednesday morning, and it's a Wednesday morning. It's a just Wednesday morning, right? You're not expecting anything to happen, in particular, on the Wednesday morning or the Thursday afternoon as we're on this journey, and then all of a sudden, by golly, Jesus pops up. How is this possible? This morning, I want us to consider, to ponder, to wonder about the wheres and the whens and the hows of Jesus as he joins us in our daily lives, as he comes up and walks alongside us on our journeys to ask us, in essence, how you doing? What, what's going on with you these days? How are you? How often does Jesus come up to us initially in the guise of a stranger and create the opportunity for us to practice resurrection, to practice hospitality toward him? When you think of the word stranger, what comes to mind? Is it danger? Is it threat? Is it opportunity in the stranger? And sometimes, because we live in small towns, sometimes the people that we seem to know the best turn out to be the stranger, the one we thought we really knew, who maybe we didn't really know as well as we thought on some days. My, but you are acting a little strange today, aren't you? Well, yes, I am, thank you. What's up with you today, stranger? Tom Long calls this the gospel getting down to local issues. And isn't that the truth? The gospel is always played out in our neighborhood. The gospel is always played out in our lives. The gospel is always played out locally, isn't it? Where we live, where we move, where we have our being. To reinforce that, Tom Long told a story of a young girl, Jenny. Her story showed up in Robert Cole's fabulous book, 
the spiritual lives of children. Jenny was a young girl from a poor family, bright, articulate, imaginative, and with a keenly developed spirituality. Jenny, for example, recounts that her uncle, who was wounded in Vietnam, is still nervous and upset, prone to frequent crying, and she wonders how God must have felt during the violence of that war. If my uncle cries now, she reflected, God must have cried too. He must have wept, don't you think? Jenny told about one day when she was walking home, and along the way she encountered an elderly woman who seemed lost and confused. Jenny asked the woman if she needed help, and of course the woman with re relief replied, well, if you could, that would be wonderful. And Ginny discovered that the, the woman had been walking to visit her daughter and had gotten disoriented, and she showed Ginny the written direction she had, and Ginny knew immediately where she'd gotten lost and where she needed to go. Ginny had other things that she needed to be doing, but, but she got the sense that getting this troubled stranger safely to her destination was the most important thing that she needed to be doing right then. So she traveled with her. She talked gently to her. She listened to her as the woman spoke of the things that were going on in her life and how frustrated she was by all of it and walked her all the way up to her daughter's house. When they arrived and Ginny started to leave, the woman grabbed her by the arm and announced that Ginny had been a godsend, that God had sent her and that later she would pray a prayer of thanks to God for having Ginny there. And then the woman gave her a kiss on the forehead. A blessing of sorts. On the way home, Ginny wondered what it would be like to be old, wondered if she were old and in need, if God would send some kid to help her. Maybe God puts you here, Ginny thought, and gives you these hints of what's ahead, and you should pay attention to them because that's him speaking to you. There on the road, as a little girl helped a stranger in need, the presence of God was played out in a neighborhood, locally, and in a way that was unexpected. Jesus sometimes comes to us in strange ways. Jesus sometimes comes to us as the stranger, joining us on the road, allowing us to tell our story. That's what happened on the Emmaus Road. And after those two, that couple had had the opportunity to share what was on their hearts, on their spirits, on their minds, in their lives, it was Jesus' turn to tell them his story all over again and become for them the word that they needed to hear then, there, now. And then another miracle. As Jesus was pretending to head on down the road, they proved that they were his followers. They invited him in. They showed hospitality to this potential stranger. Hospitality, friends, is a saving grace whenever and wherever it's offered and received. And hospitality in this story became the catalyst for the surprise ending. No, no hospitality, no big reveal. No hospitality, no surprise ending.
as Jesus may come alongside us in whatever way he continues to choose, can we, can we have enough Easter in us to entertain the possibility that hospitality will become a doorway for the gospel, a portal for resurrection, an opportunity for a surprise that is grace-filled. That Emmaus couple intended to feed Jesus the stranger that came among them, and the Easter surprise was that the stranger they invited in was no stranger but their risen Lord and wound up feeding them. Isn't that the way it goes? with hospitality. You think you're extending something to someone else and it turns out that they have the very thing that you needed all along. Go figure. Surprise. Years ago, theologian Tom Traeger was the con convocation speaker at the uh, Synod of Lakes and Prairie Synod School. This is a great event, and if you ever get the chance to go to Synod School, I say do it because it's a wonderful event. You've heard about it a little bit before, but it's sort of like vacation Bible school for the whole family. They get some of the best theologians, the best minds, the best thinkers, the most inspiring people, and they bring them there, and those people lead worship and tell stories of grace and inspiration and holiness. That's what you experience there. And I still remember one of the stories that Tom Traeger told from his life in connection with this story of the Emmaus Road. He told the people that had gathered for the convocation that Back when he was in training to become a minister himself, a part of that experience meant that he had to spend long, extended times away from his fiance, who would go on to become his wife. After one of their visits that was not nearly long enough, he had to go back. They had to part company yet again, and they said their teary goodbyes. This was years ago, so he had taken a bus. And at a stopover, on the way back to the seminary, he was sitting on a stool in a bus station diner and was depressed and lonely. He must have certainly looked the part because an elderly woman came up and sat on the stool next to him. Her clothes had seen better days and she had the look of someone who maybe spent a lot of time on the street. She commented on how sad he appeared and encouraged him to tell his story. What was going on? What's going on with you? What's up? How are you doing? You, you know how sometimes if somebody asks how you're doing, what do you say? Especially if I don't know them. Fine. <laughs> no, no, no problem here. You can be on your way. But doesn't a part of you, if somebody asks you how you're doing, doesn't there, isn't there a part of you somewhere that wants to say, how much time do you have? Do, do, you, do you really want to know? She really wanted to know, and it seemed she had all the time in the world. And she listened. And then she told him some of her life, what was going on with her, what had led her up to this Point for her. And they consoled each other. And then the, the woman noticed on the counter, a couple of stools away from them, a covered 
glass container of some donuts. Donuts, yay. Who doesn't love a donut, right, Caroline? Yeah, absolutely. So she noticed one of the, the, the donuts and she told Traeger that he might feel a little better if he ate something, so she purchased one of the donuts with what he was sure had to be the last of the money she had. The woman took the donut, handled it almost reverently as she looked at him and smiled, and then she broke the donut in two and handed him a piece. And then disappeared into the night. Hmm. Sound familiar? Traeger concluded his story by telling those gathered that sitting in that bus station diner, suddenly, suddenly, his eyes were opened. And he recognized how Christ was right there with him in the bus station. And how his not as broken heart as it was felt noticeably warmer. And like the couple from Emmaus told us what had happened and how Christ had been made known to him in the breaking of the bread. See, Jesus comes to us. He comes to us where we are, as we are, who knows how, when or where. But when Jesus does, He always gives us afterwards something to share. Thanks be to God. Friends, our hymn of response this morning is number 500 in the glory to God be known to us in breaking bread. Friends, I invite you to join your hearts and minds and spirits with me in a time of prayer. Hmm. Holy and gracious God, we give you thanksgiving this day that in Jesus Christ you continue to make yourself known, that you continue to show yourself to us, that you continue to approach us and walk with us and care about us. you continue to reveal to your people how your love and your grace, your forgiveness, your goodness, your life always gets the last word, always meets us where we are, always loves us more than we can imagine, sometimes more than we love ourselves. How your presence with us and for us opens us up rather than shuts us down, opens, opens us up rather than closes us off, opens us up rather than 
being isolated. And so as we give you thanksgiving for that, we're aware of how extending the love that we have for those closest to us is also a part of our prayer that is extended into community and nation and world. Stretch us this day, God, where we need stretched. Comfort us this day where we need comforted. Console us where we need consolation. Inspire us where we need to be inspired. Equip us to yet again be your hands, your feet, your mouth, your presence, your love, your compassion, your holiness, a channel of your grace for someone else. We may not know who or when or how or where, but you do. We pray for those we know best, for friends, families, neighbors, co-workers, all those whose joys and troubles affect us daily, we thank you for your presence in our homes, in the sanctuary, at Fairway and High V and Walmart, at Casey's, at work, at school. We pray for those we see but don't know, the ones who cross our paths, hmm, or the ones that we cross the side of, to the other side of the street to avoid, or the ones we haven't called in a while, or even the ones around town here who are mostly invisible. who remain a mystery to us because we don't know them. We ask that your spirit dwell in our community, turning strangers into neighbors, giving people purpose and compassion. Help us to see beyond what our eyes see for those who are hungry, scared, or lonely, and maybe even loving them. We pray for those that appear to us only in the media, <laughs> the people who come to us on the television screen or, or on the computer screen or, or on Facebook or the news feed, the people that are well known but we don't know. Remind us, gracious God, that even for those in authority or who hold power or who are famous, who are admired, who are envied, that they too are lonely and scared, that they too need you to walk up alongside them in reassurance and Easter life. We pray for those we don't see, the millions whose stories go untold, whose lives feel so far removed from our own. So we pray. We pray for your people in every place and ask that you remind us that no one is beyond your reach. The things and the situations, the people, what the things going on that we brought with us into this worship presence today, we lift up to you. And we ask that you redeem it all. We ask this and pray these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the one who continues to teach us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The truth is, friends, that we can never outgive God. Can't do it. We have been blessed mightily. We have been blessed ritually, but we have been blessed in ways that inspire us to respond, to share a part of what we have received. So, as we give the things that we brought with us this day to share for God's glory, we can trust that those gifts will go to the place where they need, that they will be blessed and broken and shared. God of surprises, take these gifts and astound us by what they do. Through the work of your church, restore a broken world into the beloved community you dream of for us. Show us how to take these offerings and use them to love each other deeply from the heart. For it is in your grace we trust. Amen. The closing hymn this morning, friends, is number 238 in the glory to God. Thine is the glory.
Friends, please join me in our responsive benediction. Are your hearts burning? Are they full of doubt? Have we seen the risen Christ? We go from this place to the roads of our lives, where Jesus will meet us, walk with us, feed us, and inspire us to be his disciples and witnesses. And as you go, go in joy or in doubt, know that the grace of God will uphold you, the peace of Christ will enfold you, and the Holy Spirit will make you bold, today, tomorrow, and forever.